I, I do have to confess, I think last week before this blessed rain a couple days ago was probably some of the most beautiful weather I've ever seen in our Californian history. I mean, those days last week, that kind of Monday, Tuesday zone was just incredible. And it was time to go running outside. Thank you, Jesus. So Monday, preached on Sunday, getting ready to go to the gym, come back home. My friends Mark Tox and Bob Welker are at my door with dirt for my, my garden beds, unloading it. I don't even have to pick up a, shuttle, a shovel. I'm like, this is a beautiful day, beautiful day. So I start running down and recognize that the Miner's Ravine Trail is now almost fully open. Now that trail, I've ran on that trail for 12, 13 years now. It's one of the best trails you can run on. So where our house is positioned, it's right at the beginning of Sogstead. So we can run down Sogstead, and normally we just have to run around the neighborhoods because it's been under construction for so long. But now you can run through Royer and connect on to the Miner's Ravine. So best day of my life. You know, running, it's beautiful outside. Well, as I run down by the fire department, I go onto the trail, and you have to cross underneath this bridge. And as I look underneath that bridge, there's a woman just in a lot of duress, uh, some kind of psychiatric episode of some kind. And uh, as I see her there, again, I've, I've walked by and helped in those situations countless times. But as I look under the bridge, it's dark, and her, her cart is, is strewn out underneath there. I, I didn't feel like I could help, and something didn't feel right. And it was an unusual feeling because, again, having prayed for numerous people, uh, you know I want to respond to need. I don't want to just run past people in need. We got that good Samaritan thing going on that we're supposed to follow. So I, I didn't feel right about it. So I said, you know, I'm not going to go underneath the bridge. I'm going to go up and around. So I go up and around the bend. I'm coming down into the trail, and there's really about a 50-yard stretch where there's no visibility. There's two spots on the trail, one at the beginning of the Sogstead and one right there, where if there was something you were in crisis with, it would be hard to get someone's help or attention. So I run down the trail, and as I run there, this guy comes out of the bushes. And as he's there, he puts a metal weapon into his pants, gloves on, and looks up. He's about 10 yards from me. And I startled him. And as I'm there, he's 10 yards from me. I turn around, and he charges at me. So again, I have, I, I'm, I'm a prime target. Cell phone on my hand, you know, smartwatch on my wrist. So I'm running, and I'm yelling help as loud as I can. I don't care how yellow I may look. This is my life. I'm not going to be some hero right now. So I'm running as fast as I can. I finally, I look behind. He's right behind me. I make it up to the trailhead where the street crosses at Folsom right up here. Bikers are driving by me. I'm yelling, help. No one stops. Cars are there. I'm flagging them down. No one stops. So I look around. I jet down the alleyway. Uh, I don't see him, but I don't care that I don't see him. I'm running as fast as I can. I make it to the Salvation Army and the fire department. I'm just looking around where I can just hide, you know, inside some type of place. And this woman's right in front of the Salvation Army. I said, this man just tried to rob me. I need to find some type of place to stay. She's like, well, I work for the Salvation Army. Let's get in the Salvation Army. Well, right then, this fire truck comes out. I said, perfect. Let's get into the fire department. We're there. Hey, an armed man tried to, to rob me. And they're like, get inside. And so I run to the door, buzz the door. And they open the door up. And they're like, what's wrong? I'm like, an armed man. And he comes around the corner. And so I said, he's right there, and he's armed. And so he runs across the street. They're like, get inside. They pull us in. They lock the door. And then they, you know, they're on the CB. A civilian is, is seeking refuge right now. There's an armed man in Roseville. You know, this is a big thing. And cops are coming. And here I am, breathing heavy and sweaty. And uh, as I'm there, and I'm talking with him. We can see him. And he bolts down by the, the trail and, and hides out. Unfortunately, they don't find him. So here's this guy in our city, and I'm there, and give him my report to the cop, and finally they're done taking down my information. You have an idea? I'm like, no, I don't have an idea. I was just running down the neighborhood, but I promise, you know, this is what happened. And so as I'm talking to them there, I'm then faced with that awkward moment of, do I ask for a ride? I'm like, hey, humble moment, right? Can I get a ride home? <laughs> and he's like, Sure, I'll protect you. You know, so you get in the car with this guy, and I don't want to reveal his name. Great guy. We're talking to the car. But, man, you feel like anything could come against you when you're in one of those giant cop SUVs with a shotgun right next to you. 
driving home. And again, getting to my house, I get Alex and, and Kirsten and Alec. I'm like, you won't believe what just happened to me. But I'm, I'm there in this, in this place. And again, your life has been threatened. And you know it's real. I actually got a report from a friend that night. He assaulted a police officer, this person. So that he wasn't just looking for my phone number. You know, This is a, a serious situation. But there was a key statement I caught when I'm in the fire department. The, the captain says, there's a civilian seeking refuge. And it just made me think about how our lives are threatened. Everybody is looking for a place of safety and security. And when we look at the world around us, and we recognize the needs. They may not be as obvious as mine was, but they're still looking for the same thing. It's in our nature, it's in our design to be grounded in a place of safety and stability. And see, when we look at the book of Psalms, there are, there's really one psalm we all look to in the Western world. When you think of the book of Psalms, what's the first one that comes to your mind? Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is the first one that comes to most people in the Western world's mind. Because we look at it from a literary context of an amazing piece of poetry. And it's spoken to many of us in, in tremendous ways. But you know what's unique is it's not quoted anywhere else other than Psalm 23 in the Bible. And one of the ways to really find out if something was important is how often it's re-referenced in the Bible. And again, it's, it's important and it's critical, but it's really spoken significantly to the Western world. One of the most quoted psalms and one of the most important psalms to the Israelites, the people of Israel, was Psalm 91. And Psalm 91, verse 1 and 2 says this, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. We have three very clear words there. We have shelter, we have shadow, and then finally fortress that are all used really interchangeably. And as you look at this scholarly, it, it kind of leads up to this crescendo of fortress where we got to remember the people of Israel were a mobile nomadic people. They really didn't have a home. So when you are brought out of this massive captivity, in Egypt, and you're in this exodus without a place to land, where will your stability come from? And it was in this process that they learned to make their shelter their God. Their God became their shelter. Their, their, their God became their fortress. Their God was the one in whom they put their trust. And this became so important that when this psalm was written, again, we're not clear as to who wrote it, it became a part of the fabric of the Hebrew society. They understood that they may never have a true home here on earth, but they will abide and put their trust in the Almighty. That this is what they anchor their hope on. Here's what one scholar says to give us some more clarity. Some suggest that the testimony arises from a person who had sought refuge in the temple from persecutors. Others propose that the psalmist offered thankful testimony after recovering from a serious illness. It may have been the verbal purification ritual prescribed in Leviticus 14 for restoration of a person with leprosy into the community. So it became so integrated in society, and here's what you have to remember, is when this is part of the fabric and the theology of a culture, when someone that had a disease like leprosy, because again, the leprosy we know is not the leprosy they knew. The leprosy in that culture is a generalized word for a skin condition of some kind. Now, again, with limited medical understanding, they had all these purification practices. When someone contracted a disease on their skin, they didn't know how to contain it. So they were ostracized to another community, a leper colony. So what happens is they get healed, but now the problem is how do you reintegrate them into community? Because you don't know if they're totally well, but here's the beauty of it. They get healed of leprosy. They go before the priest, and as they reenter the community, 
they would recite this psalm because they know their trust is not in some medical procedure or prescription of a condition. Their trust is in God. And if they put their trust in God, it doesn't matter what pestilence comes against their community. He is faithful to heal. It doesn't matter what comes against them. And that's the anchor and the fabric that they lived in. Now we live in a modern culture that's totally decentralized without any fabric of theology. So what happens? You live in scarcity and preservation. Because anyone at all times is now a threat in my life. So why is it that no one stops when someone calls out in times of need? Because I got to look out for my own. I gotta look out for myself. But how many know when you put your trust in Jesus, He'll make you say yes to things that no one else would say yes to? He'll make you say yes to things and put you in situations like this morning when I pull up on Vernon Street at 7 30 a.m. and a woman says, Excuse me, sir. Yes. Can I get a ride? And all those things go through my head. What if she's dangerous? Again, she's an elderly woman asking for a ride. But these irrational thoughts come to your mind. And then secondly, i got to prepare my sermon. And Jesus says, really? <laughs> Sir, I, I work for Denios. I just need a ride to Denios. I'll give you $5. I'm like, just get in the car. Because again... When people knock on your door, you know it's a God set up. When you don't have to make it happen, you know Jesus is giving you an invitation. We're driving, we're talking about the neighborhood. Turns out she's my neighbor. Pray for her, pray for her family. See, God's got a different agenda. And it starts with do we trust his agenda? And do we trust what he is setting up for us? And Psalm 91, what's so unique about this is that this is an anchor passage in the community of Israel. And it's the very thing that Satan uses to tempt Jesus with. See, we live in this concept that scripture is my safety and my structure. But we have to recognize what Matthew is saying that Satan knows how to abuse the word of God. And what Matthew does is he sets up this great bout between Jesus and Satan as how Jesus will combat the Pharisees, the experts in theology. See, sometimes the spirit isn't inside the religion that we often point to. And see, what Jesus does here is he's brought in the midst of this temptation. I want to go back one verse rather than five and six is to look at Matthew 4, 4. We have to remember the foundation of surviving the temptation and testing that Jesus is in is the word of God. What does he say? He says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. But here's what we have to back into. A lot of us can find safety and security in the written word, which is important, and it's the foundation. But the way Jesus phrases it, and what we have to remember, it's the spoken, living, active word of God, the rhema word of God. Now, again, we've seen that abused even in our church cultures where this rhema word, and you got to have faith for the word. The concept is this, Hebrews 4, The rhema of God, the word of God, is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So when Jesus quotes Deuteronomy, we have to understand, when they give this verse, and Moses is, is speaking this, that man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God, they didn't have a written Torah. They weren't log, you know, taking scrolls with them on their journey through the desert. They were dependent on the spoken word of God's spirit. And they were dependent, unfortunately, back then from an oracle from a person called Moses, or hoping that Aaron would give them something. 
But what Jesus does is he says, I send you someone called the helper, the spirit, who will teach you all things. So right now, we don't have to wait for a mountaintop and Moses to come down. Jesus brought Sinai to us called the Spirit of God. And he can speak to you at all times. And here's what's important. If you want to survive the test and the temptation of the wilderness, you have to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And what happens is the Word of God, the physical written Word, is important because it helps us calibrate what is truly the Spirit of God speaking. If what God's speaking to you doesn't align with the written Word, it's not the Spirit. I'll just speak straight to you right now. But what it does is it calibrates it. But if you only have the written word, we'll end up settling for religion, not relationship. And he's really after relationship. And if we don't know the written word, we'll tend to adopt cultural scripture and think it's Bible. Here's two cultural scriptures that a lot of us live by, unfortunately. Number one, God helps those that help themselves. You'd be surprised how often I hear this. Again, we here have been well church calibrated to know that that's not scriptural. But here's another one. I got permission from my wife to talk about this one. It's a cultural scripture that we've adopted as an axiom that we live by. But I don't know if it's biblical. Happy wife, happy life. I could feel it. That was nervous laughter. It wasn't even comedic laughter. Here's what I want to say about this one. I know you guys are like, don't do this, man. I came to church on Sunday for a good car ride home. Here's the thing is... The concept is, is, is there. There's some biblical essence in it. But when you're unhealthy, happiness can really be a far cry from holiness. See, when you, when you don't surrender your heart, mind, soul, and strength to God, happiness can really look like culture. And what we notice is the temptations that are brought up here are the same temptations that Israel has are the same temptations that Paul breaks down in 1 Corinthians 10. And for us, we have to get culture out of us and bring it to the cross. And honestly, when we live under that axiom, we can end up saying yes to things we should never do. And we're chasing happiness when really your spouse needs your holiness. And see, Jesus is not after your happiness. He's after your holiness. And if you live a holy life, I guarantee you'll have a happy life. We have to recalibrate what that looks like and what health actually is. The reason I know this is is when my wife and I had a failed adoption. We were adopting internationally. We're placed. It's a longer story than we have time for now because Linda's going to share in just a second. But as we go through this process, get the call that it's failed. My wife's from England, and she says, we're going to England. I need to get out of here. And I heard God's Spirit say, you're not supposed to go. But I succumbed to the pressure of trying to make my wife happy. I said, okay, whatever you need, whatever you need. I heard it. Don't go. Don't go. So we drive to San Francisco, call friends. They're going to get us standby tickets. We wait in the airport. We wait with a young child of our own who's nine months old. And as we wait, we wait, we wait. Finally, they, we're here on the standby list. The person comes right before they close the call. We don't get the ticket. God says, go home. She says, let's stay another day. I say, yes, dear. We go down, get our bags, wait an hour, call a hotel, get a shuttle. All to do it the next day, yet again. Every day for three days, we missed every flight. 
until finally I had to repent to my wife and say, God told me you shouldn't have gone here. And when she says, why didn't you tell me this? <laughs> we go back, friends of ours, Keith and Annie give us a timeshare for a day. And God spoke and opened up the next chapter. We now have a son named Justice in our house. What's the Spirit saying? What's the living word speaking? And will we trust him? Or will we test God like Israel did? Will we challenge his word? Will we quarrel with him? Will we go about with a negative attitude and say, God, if you're really real, do this? Or will we choose the path of trust? My friend, Linda Rungworth, is going to share a quick story about trust. Would you welcome Linda as she shares? Uh, thank you, Pastor Brandon, and thank you guys for the warm welcome, and let me just get myself all set up. So my name's Linda, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus, and I'm so glad to have an opportunity to share part of my testimony today with you guys. So I'm going to start out with a little story. Years ago, I was invited to be part of a master class for principals. And so one day, as part of our class, we had class over at a remote site where we took part in a ropes course. Has anybody done a ropes course? Does anybody not care for heights? Anybody with me on that? Okay, so this ropes course was part of the class, and I needed to do it. So I chose the least intimidating activity and soon found myself climbing a 25-foot high um, telephone pole. And what I needed to do was I needed to climb all the way to the top, and then I needed to stand up when I got there and jump off. And, of course, I had the rigging on me, but I foolishly went first. You guys know that that was not my best choice. So I'm climbing up, and the further I get, the more tired my arms are, and the smaller the ground was getting. But that's what I needed to do. So I climbed all the way up, and I looked around, and I thought about, I just have to have faith. And I really wanted to, like, I asked the guy down at the bottom who was belaying me. I said, can you just like test the rope a little for me? I, I just want to make sure you can, you can grab me. And he goes, that's not part of it. Really? <laughs> really? I'm 25 feet up here, and that's not part of it. And so I took a deep breath, and I jumped off. And obviously, I made it. I'm really glad, but you know, one of the things I try to do is I try to look for areas where I need faith and I ask God to test me in that area. And sometimes that'll look like climbing up and jumping off of a telephone pole. Sometimes that'll mean singing karaoke on a cruise ship. I did it. <laughs> but the thing is, God hasn't called me to fear. And what God has called me to do is he's called me and he's called you to trust. And we look in, in the Bible, it tells us again and again to trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And trusting God is part of our mission. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it tells us, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. We do not have to see what God 
is doing for us in order to trust and in order to have faith. Because it is not our job as Christians to know all the answers. The beauty of being a child of God is that he has all the answers. And he is capable of working in any situation, no matter what it looks like for us or what it looks like to others. It can be easy to fall into thinking that once we have accepted Christ, we should expect that all obstacles will be moved out of our way. All our prayers will be answered with what we tell the Lord we want. Yeah. And <clears throat> that, we will, that we're somehow entitled to a smooth road in life. I'm going to let you in on something. That's not what it says. That's not what God's called us to. God has called us to trust him. God has called us to have faith in him. And God has called us to be obedient to him, regardless of what it looks like and what it feels like. I came to know the Lord when I was seven. I was so excited about Jesus that I went door to door in my neighborhood. And because I was going to make sure all the kids in the neighborhood knew about Jesus and that they were saved because they had to go to heaven with me. Well, this all went well. Then my mom gets a phone call, and apparently there was a family down the street, and they were pagans. And she's like, would you tell your kid to get off my lawn? You know, I'm not wanting my kid to become a Christian, and my kid's getting excited about Jesus, and this is not what we want. And, of course, I heard that, and I was like, well, this is cool. You know, this is cool. Jesus is using even me, even though I'm a little kid. So, so I felt God's presence in my life. And then when I was 10 years old, I lost my father. But what happened was God reminded me in the scripture that God is the God to the fatherless. So I was not fatherless. I was not marginalized. I was not less cared for. If anything, I knew that God was watching out for me in a special way. And I knew that God had a calling on my life regardless of who my parents were or whether or not they were alive. The summer I turned 17 brought a big surprise for me. Suddenly, I had severe ulcers in my mouth and my throat, pain I couldn't escape, and the doctors didn't know why. Doctors gave me pain medication, which I took until I realized I had to make a choice. I was either going to take pain medication and stay at home, or I was going to find a way to live through the pain and do what God was calling me to do. That was a tough decision. And the church that I grew up in, in the faith-based university that I went to, didn't have a box for people who were sick and stayed sick. And... When I was prayed over and I didn't receive healing, I received messages from people. Why wasn't I accepting the healing God was giving me? What was the big secret sin that I had? I was like, gosh, if I had a big secret sin, I'd tell you. At a minimum, I'd tell Jesus so that we could get this show on the road. But you know what? That's not... That's not what God had for me. Because, see, God called me to obedience. God did not call me to pray a magic prayer with all the special components so that he would answer what I wanted the way I wanted it. And the fact is, God has healing for me, and God has done tremendous healing in me. And though it doesn't always look the way I thought it might, 
The fact is, he's walking with me every step. I continued to ask the Lord for healing. Though I'll be honest with you, going forward for prayer can be excruciating. It can feel like, I have felt at times like I was really disappointing the people praying for me. I was hurting their stats or something. <laughs> you know, I, it's like, <laughs> but you guys know what I'm saying. But here's what it is. If God tells me I need to go forward for prayer, I'm going to be humble and I'm going to go forward. And I'm going to accept the healing he has for me, whatever it looks like. In 2011, a new physical issue came into my life. I developed a condition where I have laryngeal spasms. My, um, my larynx closes sometimes. My, my uh, lungs are fine. My heart is fine. But sometimes my uh, larynx will close, and so it'll cut off my oxygen. So if you see me with supplemental oxygen one day, nothing's happened. It's just that day. And a lot of days I don't have to use it. And I'm really grateful for that. But this brought a lot of changes in my life. I officially had reached a new low with a diagnosis of vocal cord dysfunction. I had just married an amazing man. Shout out for Scott. That's right. That's right. And who walked through this with me and tell me every single step of the way that I was never a burden, but I was his blessing. I had to retire, and we didn't know if I would be collecting retirement or disability. And he chose to take that moment to hold me in his arms and tell me that God was our provider and that it wasn't a question of whether or not I needed to retire, that this was just what I needed to do and that he was with me all the way. I didn't have to worry about it. So... I spoke with a wise counselor who encouraged me to think of my health problems as having an unwelcome visitor in my home. And this, this was very freeing for me. He said, imagine that you have an unwelcome visitor and they come to your house and they eat all your food and they do things that you really don't like. They get in your space and you can't get rid of them until one day they decide, oh, I'm going to go to somebody else's house. He said, think of your illness in that same way. Because you have no control over it, and you are not at fault for having it. Because there's a big part of me that, with the background that I had, it was like, well, if I was sick and I wasn't getting better, it was probably my fault. But see, that's not what Jesus had for me. Jesus isn't saying, hey, the, the difficulties you face in your life, it's because you've done something. I want you to know that whatever it is that you're facing in your life, God is using that to draw you closer to him. And that he is teaching you that he is your refuge. He is your safe, safe place. And the healing he has for you, the security that he has for you is in him. It is not in what we think we should have. It is not based on our comfort. And God does not love me any less be just because I have physical issues. And please understand, I think that everyone has pain in their lives. Some of you, we can see it. Some of you, we can't. Most of us, we can't see the pain other people have. But I want you to know that your pain is just as important as anybody else's. Your pain is real, and it's yours. I've had people tell me, well, my pain is nothing like yours. And I'm like, you have a broken leg. You know, you, it's okay to be in pain. And But they're like, oh, but you deal with it. And it's like, doesn't matter what I deal with. Guys, your pain matters, and God sees you. Please know that 
the things that are dark, where you're waking up in, in the middle of the night because things are tough, God is there with you. And one of the things God showed me was, he said, Linda, you need to give me thanks. You need to give me thanks when it hurts. You need to give me thanks that things aren't, your life didn't turn out the way you thought it would. You need to give me thanks that there have been people in your life who have hurt you. You need to pray for the people who've hurt you, and you need to forgive them. And I need to forgive those people because, not because it did them any favors. God wants me to forgive people, and he wants you to forgive others because that person is taking up space in your head that does not belong to them. The space in your head belongs to Jesus. Right? Can I get an amen on that? That's right. Okay. And I have to say, I know that God heals. I had severe pneumonia a few years ago. And um, I was so sick, they didn't want to put me in the hospital, which I thought was interesting. But it's all good. And, of course, I have my own oxygen at home, because so I was kind of set up. But God told me that a friend was going to come over and pray for me, who the friend was, and that when she prayed for me, I was going to get healed. So I was pretty excited. So I talked to her on the phone. She came over after work. She sat on my couch. She prayed for me. An hour, be- hour later, I was like, running around, doing great. I had to go back to the doctor the next day to get cleared to go back to work. And the doctor came in, saw me, and said, I'm sorry, I have the wrong room. Because, and he's like, this doesn't make sense. There's no way you could be this much better. And I said, oh, God healed me. Because that's a thing. <laughs> and, and, right? That's a thing. And he He looked at me, examined me, and goes, yeah, that's a thing. (laughs) Absolutely, that's a thing. And the Bible's very explicit that we are to walk by faith and not by feelings. My physical health is only one part of me, and it's only one part of you. After experiencing deep wounding as a child of sexual abuse, I'm free in my mind and in my spirit. God has shown up and healed me emotionally in ways that count more deeply to me than my physical health. And going through the 12 steps of Celebrate Recovery, God has used that process for me to find so much healing. And... I am so secure in how much God loves me. And God has walked me through that path of forgiving others. Because Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I didn't deserve to be forgiven. And it's not my job to decide who should be forgiven and who shouldn't. Because that is all up to Jesus. And... So walking through Celebrate Recovery, it has changed my testimony. It gave me a place where I could walk through and identify what my hurts, habits, and hang-ups really are. And a path to finding um, health and healing. God has called me to give thanks every day for everything. This is obedience. I have so many wonderful things I'm grateful for. But it also means I'm to give thanks to God for the pain I experience. It means if I wake up in pain or I have trouble breathing, I give him thanks. If I wake up in the middle of the night not feeling well, I give thanks. And then I ask him who he wants me to pray for. Because one of the things that happens is if you have a chronic illness, you're that much more available to be in prayer. If you have to sit still, prayer's a good thing to do. I I encourage you, do this. And 
being thankful in all things has made me more available to the Lord, but it also has put me in a place where I'm not focusing on what I think I'm missing out on. You guys, don't waste your life focusing on things that you think you're missing out on. Because God is present in your life, regardless of your circumstances. And he loves you, and he sees you. I thank you so much for letting me share my testimony with you today. Awesome. Let's stand together. Scott, if you want to come forward as well, let's just do a quick prayer. We have the prayer team come forward as well. We just want to make availability for prayer. Father, we just thank you for this amazing day. Thank you for the story of Linda. God, we just uh, believe this testimony is relevant for many of us right now that are on that journey of trust, on that journey of faith. And God, we just pray right now for those that are in the middle of suffering and sickness. God, we believe for your healing and restoration. God, we believe that you will give them faith and hope in their time of need. Lord, as we talked about this trial of testing and when we quarrel against you, when we trust you, God, we thank you that your spirit speaks, that your rhema word is available. So, God, we just believe right now that you would come and speak to each and every person in need, that we would respond to those areas where we need prayer and support to know that these times of difficulty are not meant to be lived on our own, but you have brought community around us. So, Jesus, we make ourselves available to what you want to speak to your church in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's give it up one more time for Jesus. Amen.